Hello everybody, and welcome to today's chem lesson. Today we're going to talk about the history of the atom and how we evolved and changed that picture over time. How we started with theories and ideas and thoughts that we expanded on and explored with scientific experiments and processes. The first people to think about the idea of an atom, the first people to theorize that an atom was a thing that existed, were the ancient Greeks. And they said, if I break down something, if I cut it in half, and then I cut that half in half, and then I cut that half of a half in half, over and over and over again, I will eventually end up with the smallest thing I can have, something that can no longer be cut in half. And they said that that thing was an atom. And they thought it was a hard sphere, right? Just a sphere that they really couldn't imagine anything else about. But these were the first people to say, hey, there's this building block that if you put a bunch of them together, build bigger things. And this idea of the atom stuck around for a very, very long time. As people experimented and learned more, those ideas expanded, and we got a more clear and definite picture. But before anyone was able to theorize things about the atom, they discovered something else. They discovered the law of conservation of mass. The idea that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Matter only changes form from one type to another. Very, very similar to the idea of law of conservation of energy, which we talked about in a previous video. When we have chemical reactions and chemical changes, there is no loss of mass. Right? We don't start with 10 grams and end up with 8 we keep the mass. If we start with 10 grams, we will end with 10 grams. If we start with 3 grams, we will end with 3 grams. The form of that mass can change. We can start with a solid that becomes a gas. We can start with a gas that becomes a liquid. But the total mass is not going to change. And after discovering this and doing more and more experiments, a group of scientists who each came up with their own piece of data were able to put everything they learned together into the atomic theory. The atomic theory is made up of these five statements. And these five statements laid the groundwork for learning more and more about the atom. and discovering more of what the atom looked like and how an atom behaves and bringing us away from the picture of just a solid sphere into the more realistic and accurate model that we have today. The first piece of the atomic theory was the thing that the ancient Greeks came up with. All matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. This idea stuck around. The second piece of the atomic theory says that atoms of an element, if we have two atoms of oxygen, those atoms should be identical in size, mass, and other properties. So these should be equal. It also says that if I have two atoms of a different element, let's say chlorine, and we do this to show chlorine, these atoms should be equal because they're both chlorine. But the two oxygens and the two chlorines should be different. Right? Atoms of an element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. Atoms of different elements are different in size, mass, and other properties. And so two oxygens, the same. Two chlorines, the same. An oxygen and a chlorine, different. 
the third piece of the atomic theory says that atoms themselves cannot be broken down or created or destroyed. The fourth piece of the atomic theory is actually something that you instinctively should recognize. This piece of the atomic theory says that atoms, when they make compounds, right, when two different elements combine, they combine in whole number ratios. That means we see things like H2O, CO2, C6H12O6, and these are good. But we don't see things like Na2.5, Cl3.1. All right, we combine in whole number ratios, so that means these decimals, and anytime you might think of putting a fraction somewhere, those are bad. That's not going to happen. Compounds are made with whole number ratios only. H2O1, C1O2, C6, H12O6. We're not going to have decimals. We're not going to have fractions when we're looking at atomic symbols, elemental symbols, compounds. The last piece of the atomic theory says that atoms in a chemical reaction are combined, separated, or rearranged. And we do see that when we look at chemical reactions. Right? Here's a chemical reaction I just wrote out. It's the burning of methane. When methane burns and this chemical reaction happens, the C's and the H's separate, the O's separate, and they get rearranged, recombined to make new things. Instead of CH4, now we have CO2 and H2O. Right? We no longer have our starting pieces. We have new combinations, new rearrangements. The originals were separated to make these new things. The atomic theory and these five statements laid the groundwork for other scientists to build upon. They laid the groundwork for other scientists to look at these statements and try to determine if they were true or not. And over time we did learn that some of these are not true. We're going to learn in a later video about isotopes, which are atoms of the same element that have a different size and a different mass. We're going to talk about protons, neutrons, and electrons, which are subdivisions of an atom. We're going to talk about how we've made artificial atoms and how through nuclear chemistry we destroy atoms. So even though these statements, for the most part, are good, right? number 1, 4, and 5 are fantastic, 2 and 3, these statements here, don't hold true. That doesn't mean that the atomic theory itself should be thrown out. It still is a fantastic summary of the things that we know about the atom. But we need to adjust these statements to reflect the actual truth and the things that we have learned. At the time that this was written, at the time that the atomic theory was put together, we were still using the idea of an atom as a sphere, as a hard sphere. And we did not really have any idea of what the inside of the atom looked like or how the atoms behaved on a grander level. The first person to actually make a discovery about the atom itself was a guy by the name of J.J. Thompson. J. 
J.J. Thompson was the first one to actually see and actually describe the atom as something other than a hard sphere. J.J. Thompson did experiments with something called the cathode ray tube, which you can think of as a very long, skinny light bulb. And when you put a current, right, when you put electricity through it, you get a beam of light. I'm actually going to change the color of this beam of light. You get a beam of light. And what Thompson discovered was if you put a magnet near this cathode ray tube, you get a reaction from the beam of light itself. The beam of light will bend when the magnet is there. And this leads Thomson to think about the inside of the atom. And he comes up with this theory of his that he says, well, you know, maybe there's something inside of an atom that gets activated by electricity that isn't there when the atoms are neutral. And he thinks and he thinks and he says, well, this thing is related to electricity, so I'm going to call it an electron. And he comes up with this idea that electrons are inside of the atom. Right. Instead of a hard sphere, which is what we were working with before that, Thompson says, how about a hard sphere that's positive filled with negative chunks that I'm going to decide are called electrons. And he calls this model of the atom the plum pudding model of the atom only because chocolate chip ice cream had not been invented yet. Right? The idea that there is a mostly positive base with a bunch of negative chunks inside. He's the first one to come up with this idea that looking into the atom, there might be more than just a single sphere. The next person to make any headway was a guy named Rutherford. And Rutherford was actually a student of Thomson. And he set out to prove that Thomson's model was correct. And he did an experiment to try to show that his teacher, his co-worker, were, was correct in his model of the atom. But instead of discovering that Thompson was correct, he actually proved that Thompson was wrong. He did an experiment where he shot tiny particles at a piece of gold foil and instead of a bunch of them bouncing off, the thing he discovered was that they went right through. And so his discovery was that the atom is mostly empty space, and there's a small, dense nucleus. Rutherford's experiment, Rutherford's gold foil experiment, was set up in a way where he would shoot particles at this piece of gold foil and see what happened. He surrounded it with photo paper so that it would develop when these particles that he couldn't see struck the photo paper. And he went into this thinking, I'm gonna shoot ping pong balls at a brick wall. And when I shoot ping pong balls at a brick wall, they're all gonna bounce off. But instead of seeing that result, what he saw was that almost all the particles went straight through the gold foil and only a couple of them bounced off 
and reflected to the sides. And so he says, well, I'm not shooting ping pong balls at a brick wall because ping pong balls don't travel through brick walls. That's not the way they work. So I must not have a brick wall here. I must have something like a chain link fence. Mostly empty space. So all those particles can go through. But every once in a while, a particle will hit one of the pieces of wire. And so he takes the idea of the solid sphere that the ancient Greeks had, which was upgraded by Thompson to the plum pudding model. And Rutherford debunks that and he says, this is not an accurate model of the atom. Instead, we have a small, dense nucleus where all of the mass is, and the rest of the atom is mostly empty space. There are electrons throughout here, but I don't know where. And so he upgrades the model of the atom to something a little more realistic. Atom is mostly empty space. There is a small, dense nucleus which is very different from these two models that show it as a solid sphere. But Rutherford wasn't the last person to make a model of the atom. Rutherford's model of the atom was soon debunked by Niels Bohr. And Niels Bohr's model of Neil, Niels Bohr's model of the atom, again upgraded and made the model more realistic. We already knew that the solid sphere was not good, and that Thompson's plum pudding model was better. We found out because of Rutherford that the plum pudding model wasn't good and that instead we should use this mostly empty space model of the atom. And Bohr's model of the atom upgraded the empty space model only a little bit. What he discovered was that the electrons don't just randomly float around in the empty space. Bohr discovered that there are very specific differences, very specific places where the electrons exist. Almost like a miniature solar system with the nucleus as the sun and the electrons acting as planets that orbit that sun. So he came up with this planetary model of the atom. And this is the atom that we're going to use as we move forward, as we look at atomic concepts and atomic theories. Bohr's model is the one that we are going to stick to. But it's not the most up-to-date model of the atom. Bohr's model of the atom is fantastic. But as we learned more and got more advanced technology to actually look at atoms, we created the quantum mechanical model. And the quantum mechanical model is the most up-to-date and most recent model of the atom. And it builds upon Bohr's planetary model of the atom. which we already know is the most up-to-date one beforehand. And the quantum mechanical model shows that the electrons don't really orbit like planets. That's a very much simplified version of what's going on. The quantum mechanical model shows that if there's a small dense nucleus in the middle, 
and we want to find electrons, we can find electrons in specific shaped areas. So there could be electrons in this blue shape. There can be electrons in this green shape. There can be electrons in this dark blue shape. And depending on how many electrons there are, they can be found in any number of these different regions. Instead of like a planet, it's more like a random cage. Right? We know there's an electron somewhere in here, but I can't tell you exactly where it is. And these regions, these electron probability regions, are called orbitals, which are defined as areas with the most likely position of an electron. Basically, the idea of the orbital says, I know that this is your address, but I don't necessarily know which room of your house you're going to be in at any given moment. But I do know that 95% of the time you're going to be in this building, in this apartment, in this home. very different from watching a planet as it goes through its orbit. And with that, I'm going to transition us over to our Google Classroom. Uh, make your way over there where we're going to take attendance and have some announcements, and I will see you in a second.